you know what? I can't stand this anymore. Right. I'm gonna go out and look for him. Do you wanna join me? Tough, you're coming. <sighs> What are you doing? You're coming with me as well. Could you stop getting in the way? I need to find Sam. God, I don't even know where I am. God, I'm terrible at navigation. Hang on. Navigation. Migration. Shit! The video! Oh. What are you doing? You're coming with me as well. <sighs> yeah, hello everyone, yeah. Welcome to the next acquisition of behaviour video. Uh, Oi, Benito! Get your act together, will ya? Oh, okay. Hello everyone! Yes, it is the seventh episode in the Acquisition of Behaviour series now. In the past four videos, we've been talking about the basic cognitive mechanisms of behaviour, right? We've been talking about perception, learning, recognition, discrimination, categorization, all that stuff, yeah? Well, in the next section of this series, we're going to be looking at how those fundamental cognitive mechanisms influence animals. Okay, so we're going to be looking at um, the bigger picture, if you like. Um, so today, we're going to be talking about animal navigation and migration, which is a topic which is actually quite interesting. Um, so animal navigation is the ability of animals to um, find their way around. Pretty obvious, right? Now, that can be for a whole load of reasons. It may be very advantageous to, you know, be able to navigate yourself around an environment, whether that be to find refuge, let's say for predators chasing you or whatever, so you don't get lost, um, but also, you know, to find a mate, to find food, to find um, food which you previously stored, all this kind of stuff. And it involves a whole load of mechanisms which we've already talked about. So perception, learning, memory, all that stuff. And it's particularly useful, obviously, in migrating species, which we'll come on to in, uh, later in the video. Now, we like a good definition to start off with. And here's the first one. So spatial orientation is when an individual needs and acquires representation of a goal's location of how to get to it. Right? Sounds like a bit of a mouthful, but when you read it through, it's quite um, obvious. Now, there are two basic mechanisms that animals use to navigate. So let's go through the first one. The first one is egocentric spatial localization. And that is localization relative to the body axis of the individual. Okay? Ego obviously means yourself, right? Basic. Um, and um, one of the main mechanisms at which they do this is through dead reckoning, also known as path integration. Oh my God, can't speak. Anyway, and that is using individual's own speed and direction in which to navigate. So it's all about you, basically. You're um, navigating yourself around your environment based on things that you're doing. So as an animal is moving through its environment, it's collecting information about itself. Uh, so that could be things like step length, step orientation, turn, all this kind of stuff, okay? And it's based on the idea that animals have an internal sense of direction, right? And this has been shown in an insect called the cataglyphus ant, okay? Which lives in burrows in the sand. Okay? Now what these ants do when they emerge from their burrows in the sand to forage is that they'll move in loops of increasing diameter. So let's say the hole is here. When the ant emerges, it'll move 
and as it's moving out, it'll move out like a spiral, okay? So it moves in circles around the nest, okay? Now, using that then, it's well easy to get back. So you just need to go back on yourself, okay, and spiral back in again. So therefore, it increases the chance of the ant finding its way back to its nest, because all it needs to do is circle around the nest, okay? Very easy. Um, now, there are some problems to egocentric spatial lo localization in this way, is that, because if you make an error at some point, then it doesn't account for that. Then you're buggered, basically. You make one error and you're buggered. Um, so it doesn't compensate for any off-course displacement, right? Now, egocentric spatial localization is very good for animals which aren't going to travel very far. If you're going to be traveling long distances, then doing all this stuff relative to your own body axis gets a bit complicated. It's a bit more difficult. So the other type, of um, localization and probably the most common type is allocentric spatial localization, also known as geocentric spatial localization. And this is the mechanisms animals use to find a goal with respect to external features. And these external features are usually in the form of beacons and landmarks. Now, I bet you've wondered all your life is there a difference between a beacon and a landmark? You have, haven't you? Well, a beacon is a spatial cue, so it gives an indication on where that animal is um, in space, whereas um, a landmark is a distance cue, right? So it gives the animal an indication on how far away you are from a given place, okay? Now, a great study on this was done by a guy called Morris and his gang on rats, okay? Of course it's going to be rats, we love rats. Um, so what they did, they got a tank of milky water, right, and um, in some, they um, put a little stand in the middle of the milky water maze, if you like, um, and it was black, so it was easily visible, and it protruded um, above the surface of the water, okay? So when the rats were released into this um, watery, milky water tank, they would swim towards um, the black stand, okay? Now, then, when the black stand was removed, instead, a white stand was used, which was submerged um, below um, the surface, so the rats couldn't see it. What they did then was they observed the rats, and they saw that the rats did little, made little circles, like swimming around where the original black stand used to be. Okay, so they were conditioned, if you like. So see how all the stuff we've learned before is relating back to all this stuff. So they were conditioned to move towards where the black um, stand used to be. So objects in fixed locations are obviously very good at guiding an animal to their goal. And one of the ways in which they can do this is through template matching and local views, okay? So this is where the local view of an object is compared to one which was previously memorised, okay? And a great example of this was done by, of course, the one and only Tim Bergen on digger wasps, okay? So these are solitary wasps, they live lonely lives, how sad, but they live in the ground and um, they use landmarks to um, find their way back to the nest, right? So what um, Tim Bergen did he did, made a circle of pine cones around the entrance to the nest of these digger wasps, okay? Now, if he made um, the circle of pine cones whilst the wasp was still in the nest, then when the wasp left the nest, it would do these orientation flights, which we've talked about in a video before, um, do the orientation flights, fly off, do its business, and find its way back to the nest. However, if the position of the cues were changed whilst the wasp was away from the nest, it couldn't find its way back. Okay, so it's using the pine cones as landmarks. And also what Tim Bergen did, if you move the circular pine cones, don't change the shape of the pine cones in any way, but just move it so it's not over the nest anymore, then the wasp would come down and start looking for the burrow in the centre of the pine cone circle. Okay, so not where the actual nest is. Another mechanism for allocentric spatial localization is the vector sum model. 
Okay, and this is based on that animals can use multiple landmarks to encode information. So it specifies um, the location of a particular point in more detail. Okay, and a great example to show this was on gerbils. Well, okay, Whew, shock, um, by Cheng and Spetch. And what they did was they had two different landmarks and they put um, a reward between the two landmarks. Okay, so let's say landmark one is here, landmark two is here, food's here. However, in the second trial, if the landmarks were moved further apart from each other, where each landmark was moved the same distance apart, so let's say here and here, the gerbils still search for food within this range here. Okay? So it's almost like that the gerbils are doing some weird calculation here um, to work out because they're looking at where the food is relative to the two landmarks. Multiple bearings is also a mechanism which increases your chance of finding a specific location because it confines um, the search area in which you're looking for that specific location. And a lot of work to show this has been done on a bird called the Clark's Nutcracker, which caches food. And it uses navigation to find these buried caches. And after one month, they can still find their cache food with accurate detail, some even after nine months. Amazing. Right, thus mechanism is root learning. And this is all based on multiple stimulus um, response interactions. And this root learning increases with age, going back to the orientation flights of bees. When they're younger, they'll do the orientation flights, but as they get older, they don't need to anymore because they've learned the route. Okay, so let's talk about animal migration then. What is it? Well, it's the movement between habitats, and this can happen on varying scales, from the Arctic Tern, which basically migrates from the Arctic all the way down to Antarctica and back again each year, incredible, to um, wildebeest across the African plains, which, relative to the migration of the Arctic Tern, is quite small. And it's the result of integration of a variety of spatial and temporal information. Now, obviously, it has a lot of benefits to it, otherwise it wouldn't happen. So all the benefits. Um, reduce predation risk in the place where you're going from. Um, avoiding adverse climatic conditions. Um, that's a good reason why many birds, in particular, um, migrate. Um, access to higher quality food as well. If anything with its benefits, it's going to have its costs. It's a general trend which we've seen quite a lot in this series. So the costs are it's energetically expensive, you know, to move. I mean, moving houses, you know, tiring enough. So imagine moving between, you know, continents every year of your life. Um, exposure to severe weather whilst you're migrating. You're also exposed to predation whilst you're migrating. Let's say you get really tired, that means you're probably weaker, um, so a nice easy target for a predator. And also there could be competition of territories in the place where you're going. Now animals use a multitude of different cues in which to migrate. These could be visuals, so using the light, or non-visual. Now there's loads of them, so we're only going to cover a few. And, in fact, it's likely that animals can use more than one type of cue. However, using more than one type of cue requires a higher cognitive demand. So usually there is a dominant cue which um, an animal uses, and if that cue fails for some reason, they usually have some sort of a backup. Okay? But there is usually one cue which is dominant. Now many animals can use the sun as a compass because its daily trajectory um, provides the animals with longitudinal and latitudinal information. However, this does require a knowledge of how the sun moves across the sky, or rather we do, because obviously the sun doesn't move, we move around the sun. Whew, let's get that basic physics sorted out. Um, so the animals require some sort of internal clock in which to do this, and this is known as ephemeris function. And this often involves using the polarisation of light, which is something that the monarch butterfly uses, arguably one of the most impressive um, migratory feats of all. The monarch butterflies move, migrate from Canada all the way to Mexico to spend the winter months. Okay, absolutely fantastic. What I mean by that is that they're put out of sync with the sun's position. And there have been loads of experiments done, especially on cage birds, starlings mostly. 
okay? Now, something you may not know is that birds tend to orientate themselves in a particular direction at certain times of the day, if they can see the sun, okay? And it's known that every hour they change that orientation by about 15 degrees, okay? So therefore, if you keep a load of starlings in the dark, where they can't see the sun, for six hours, right? Then if you expose them to the light again, then they would be orientating themselves 90 degrees, six times 15, away from where they should be orientating themselves, yeah? Because if they can't see the sun, they'll just move around in random directions causing chaos. Now another cue, which has been known for quite a long time actually, since the 1800s, is magnetic sense, that animals can sense the Earth's magnetic field. Because, obviously, the Earth is basically one massive magnet with a North Pole and a South Pole. Now, I don't want to be deemed a racist on this series because I have no idea where this guy comes from, but I've got to say, he has the most awkwardly spelled name in the whole of this series, so bugger you. Um, it's a guy called Wilchko, right? Brilliant. And he did an experiment on robins, where he kept them in cages, and surrounding the cage was what's called a Helmholtz coil, and that creates a magnetic field around the cage, okay? And it prevents um, the Earth's magnetic field um, affecting the robin's behaviour, okay? And what's great about that is that Wilchko can um, change where um, experimental north and south is, okay? And then what Wilczko did is that he um, measured um, migratory restlessness, okay? And in the spring he showed that um, the robins had a preference to move towards where experimental north was, and in the autumn it was absolutely um, the other way around. So they had a preference for moving to the south. So, thank you, Wuchko, on that information. Now, this magnetic sense and the signals from the stars can be used together as a compass, right? And this was something studied by Cochrane in Grey Cheeked and Swainson's thrushes. Now, Cochrane exposed these thrushes to a tunnel of magnetic field at the twilight period, which was the time that these birds normally take off, okay? And they then looked to see in which direction the birds travelled in, right? Now, if the stars, the position of the stars was the most important cue, the dominant cue, then the direction that the thrushes travelled in wouldn't be changed, right? They would just move in the same direction which they would have done even if um, they hadn't been put in the magnetic tunnel at all, okay? If the magnetic centre is the most important, then they'd go in a different direction. They'd go in the wrong direction, okay? Because the magnetic tunnel, the direction of the magnetic field there, is in a different direction to that of um, the Earth. Okay? However, what if the birds were using signals from the twilight sun and the magnetic field, okay? So, if um, the direction of the magnetic field was changed by putting them through this magnetic tunnel, and then um, the birds were released, into an area where there was no twilight, so they weren't visible to the sun, then they'd move in the wrong direction. So let's say the sun's over here, and usually the birds would move upwards in this direction, okay? Now, if the direction of the magnetic field is changed, so it moves that way rather than that way, okay, then the, the direction the birds would travel in would differ. So if we removed the sun this time, and the magnetic field is pointing, um, you know, up, nor as it normally would, then the bird would travel in this direction, okay? So the bird using information from the twilight of the sun and um, the direction of the magnetic field. Now what the really interesting thing is, if you studied the direction of the birds on the next night, no magnetic tunnel or anything involved here, um, if they were going in the wrong direction um, the night before, then they would be going in the right direction on the second night, okay? So this leads to the idea that every night 
the, um, st the, st the thrushes are calibrating their own compass. So every night birds are calibrating their compass um, in order to make decisions on what would be the right direction to go in. And this could explain why um, birds are able to migrate over the magnetic equator, why the direction of the magnetic field um, is variable. Now, genetics also has an influence on migratory behaviour, but if you think back to the second video, we covered a classic example of that with those black caps and measuring restlessness. So, if you want to know more about that, hop back to the second video, you know, treat yourself. I'll get an extra view. <laughs> So in this video, we're going to be talking about something a little bit more depressing. We're going to be talking about how humans have impacted on the migration patterns of animals. Um, there's some obvious um, factors, uh, like habitat change, climate change, but also biotic interactions between animals. So in terms of habitat change then, um, some lots of long distance migrants require stopover sites. These stopover sites are used to refuel and are often very specific. Now a species of bird called the red knot has a stopover site in China, mud flats on China, which now in our modern day are being heavily built on um, by through industrialization. Okay? So if the birds can't get there to have a little rest, you know, a little snack or whatever, a nice little drink, then they've got no choice but to carry on. Therefore, they'll be weaker and less likely to make the full migration. Aquatic habitats can also be changed through irrigation, damming, logging, all this sort of stuff. And this has huge effects on migrating fish species. Classic ones being, you know, Atlantic salmon, eels, and a whole host of other different species. And obviously, terrestrial habitats, roads, fences, gates, you know, reservoirs. Canals are all obstructing animal migration patterns. And of course, obviously, those two horrible words, climate change, is also having an effect. Um, it's shifting migration patterns of certain species and even stopping um, species from migrating at all. And this is causing increased competition for resources because if these animals are buggering off somewhere else, then they're going to have to feed on the stuff which is already there which other animals are relying on. So it's going to cause a whole pot lava, a whole load of fighting for resources between different species. And obviously these shifts in migratory patterns are having an effect on breeding seasons of these animals and population sizes in general. The route which migratory species take is also um, being altered in certain species. And this has knock-on effects on certain food webs, certain um, food webs are reliant on particular um, species um, to maintain population sizes of other species in that ecosystem, okay? Particularly keystone species, but that's ecology, we don't need to go into that. Um, a good example of direct human influence on uh, migration patterns is um, the hunting of snow geese. Snow geese completely changed um, their route, migratory route, because so many humans, bloody humans, wanted to shoot them, okay? And that's having knock-on effect somewhere else. Oh, God, if you don't worry, you know, it's not too depressing, everything's all right, just about. But anyway, that's just about what we've got time for today, so I'll see you tomorrow when we're going to be talking about territoriality. So on that note, get off my patch. Off, off, off.